request uh, VP Govinda Prabhu to introduce Maharaj. Maharaj, those who do not know Maharaj. Hare Krishna, thank you so much, Prabhuji. Hare Krishna, Dhanur Pranam, Maharaj. Hare my Krishna. pleasure to welcome you on behalf of uh, our Bhakti Vedas. And uh, there are many those here who have been in touch and been with you in the past, I think in Bhakti Shakti and many other courses, Maharaj. Ji. So, uh, for everyone, Anuruddha Prabhuji has already posted a bit of introduction, so I'm going to read that for the benefit of everyone. Okay. So, His Holiness uh, Bhakti Vityan Vinasha. Narsimha Maharaj was initiated by Srila Prabhupada in London in 1971. That's nearly 50 years. A year later, he received the second initiation. He has been preaching for last 20 years in Asian countries such as India, Philippines, China, and Thailand. Through his years of preaching, he has given countless souls practical guidance and deep inspiration. Speaking in Mayapur in 1994 from Samal Krishna Goswami Maharaj. Much of a change in his lifestyle since Maharaj has always been strict in his sadhana. However, gets to know Maharaj admires and respects his sincere and faithful practice of chanting holy names of the Lord. He truly walks his talk. Maharaj has been teaching with Mayapur Institute since his inception. Hare Krishna. Maharaj, we are Hare looking Krishna. forward to your association. Thank you so much. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Thank you, Prabhu, for your kind words. I'll try to live up to them. Okay, Om Ajnana Timarandasya Gyananjana Shalakaya Chaksurun Militanyena Tasmai Shri Guru Venama Vanchakaupata Rubyascha Kripa Sindhu Bhayavacha Patita Nam Pavane Bhyo Vaishnava Bhyo Namo Nama Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nichananda Shri Advaita Gadatha Shri Vasadi Gaur Bhaktavinda Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Ram. So I have the good fortune of being with you for the next three week, three weekends, and during that time we have to cover the remaining five chapters of the second canto. So we're beginning on chapter six today. So chapter 6 is Purusha Shukta Confirmed. So you've been studying, when did you begin the first canto? Must have been last year, maybe, at what time? Six November. November. April, I'm sorry. Hmm? April. April, Maharaj. April. April. Okay, so about one year. Good. All right, so here we are in second canto. We're still in the Pada Padma, still seeing the lotus feet of the Lord. Very important for us to get a good basis, get a good grasp of the lotus feet of Lord Sri Krishna. We can hold on to his lotus feet will help us to go through the rest of the course. So chapter 6 is entitled Parusha Shukta. So Parusha, we know, we're always thinking we're the Parusha. Of course we're trying to be the Parusha, but we're not actually. We're tiny, tiny parts and parcels of the Lord. He's the actual Parusha. And uh, Sukta, Purusha Sukta, when I hear Sukta, I think of the oh, Bengali Sukta, oh, very nice. Uh, yeah, Sukta, yeah, I, my favorite Bengali Sukta. Uh, anyway, this is Sukta, this is a little different, this is uh, Su meaning uh, well or good and ka, ka, Kata, this is uh, spoken or words. So it's a 
It's a glorification. There's a Purusha Shukta. The original Purusha Shukta is there in the Rig Veda. Maybe some of you are worshipping Shaligram Shila, or maybe every day you recite Purusha Shukta. Anybody? Recording in progress. Anybody reciting Purusha Shukta? Sahasra Sirsa Purusha Sahasraksha Sarasraksha. Like that, begins like that, you know. I think it's eight, 15 or 18 verses. And it's a glorification of the Lord, how he has a thousand heads, Sahasra Sirsha, a thousand bodies, a, a thousand heads, like that. So this, this uh, chapter of the Bhagavatam is entitled Purusha Shukta Confirmed. So we'll see in the course of this chapter how the position of the Lord is confirmed. In the Purusha Shukta prayers, the Lord is glorified. Uh, I'll just try to read for you. There's a, I have a few of the verses here from the Purusha Shukta. The, the begins, uh, the Supreme Lord is a form of the universe and has a thousand heads, a thousand eyes and a thousand feet, for he, for he contains all the living entities. Having pervaded the universe completely to give, to give, to give it existence, being independent, he extended himself. He extended himself, if, if to a size of ten fingers. So like that, this is something from the Rig Veda. Those of you who are interested, you can read the Purusha Shukta from the Rig Veda. So this chapter of the Bhagavatam is confirming the teachings of the Purusha Shukta, that the Lord is the cause of the universe and everything in the universe is contained within the Lord. So, the, we're, we're seeing here in this uh, chapter, Lord Brahma is instructing Narada Muni, his son. Narada Muni wants to understand who is actually the creator of the universe. There was some confusion in the mind of, Lord, of, the mind of Narada. He was thinking that Lord Brahma was the supreme in the universe. But then he saw Lord Brahma meditating and so he was puzzled. And he inquired from his father. And the result of that inquiry, Lord Brahma is speaking, explaining to him who is actually the creator of the universe. And he's describing, in this chapter, he begins with a description of the, the universal form, the virata rup, or the... Uh, the Virata Vishwarup, the Vishwarup or the Virata Rup, the universal form of the Lord. How within that form of the Lord everything is contained. Now you already studied the universal form in the beginning of the second canto. We had Sukadeva Goswami telling Maharaj Parikshit the first steps in God realization, but seeing the Lord through the different features of the universe. So here, in the beginning of this chapter, Lord Brahma is describing more about the Vishwarup, the different parts of the universal form of the Lord. And we can see something of the Lord, how he is responsible for everything which is in, within the universe. Indeed, there's nothing in the universe which is not from the Lord. It's all 
due to him. So the first verse, you can see, Lord Brahma said, the mouth of the Virata Purush is the generating center of the voice and the controlling deity is fire. I don't know how fire relates to voice. It's, that was a puzzle for me to read this. I don't quite get the connection with the voice and the fire. Anyway, we have to realize these things gradually as we go on. Anybody has any ideas how we can relate voice with the deity of fire? We all have a voice. How is it connected with fire? It's bewildering to the mind. This is all the inconceivable nature of the Lord, that so many things are just beyond the power of our mind and senses. We have to understand simply by hearing. All right, so then he talks about the skin and the six other layers generating centers of the Vedic hymns and his tongue is a productive center of different foodstuffs and delicacies for offering to the demigods, the forefathers and the general mass of people. So that's reasonable. The tongue is the center of different foodstuffs and delicacies. We can understand the relation Ship there. We know the tongue is very fond of tasting. So Srila Prabhupada writes in the purport, just reading uh, from uh, that first paragraph in the purport here, halfway through he says, in the, in the spiritual world all the perverted forms of material variegatedness are fully represented in their original spiritual identity. The only difference is that material activities are contaminated by the three modes of material nature, whereas the potencies in the spiritual world are all pure because they are engaged in the unalloyed transcendental service of the Lord. So Prabhupada relates us to the spiritual world. He doesn't want to dwell on the material. He's always bringing us to understand what is the goal, that we want to understand connection to Krishna. So everything in this material world has its origin in the spiritual world. But in the spiritual world, everything is pure and uncontaminated. The material world is a perverted reflection of the spiritual world. So like that we understand something of this universal form. Worshipping the universal form, it's something which, uh, who would you say, what kind of people would be more attracted to worship? the universal form. Let me ask you. Rajavija Prabhu, can you tell me who would worship the universal form? Mostly, mostly the karmis. Karmis doors. Karmis? No, well, karmis are generally fruit of workers and they don't have an interest in spirituality. Their interest is really just sense gratification. Or are you talking about a karmi in the real sense that they follow the Vedas but for sense gratification? Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Understanding the universe in relation to the body of the Supreme Lord. We know, 
Right. Yes. Yes, some people, you know, you bring them to the temple, we show them deities, and they're like, they're just looking, is this God? <laughs> you know, it's just beyond their comprehension, it's just too much for them to understand. They see the deities and they think, well, what is it? Is it just, a, is it just an exhibition, just dolls, exhibitions, statues? They cannot understand the transcendental form of the Lord. They're not ready for it yet. But you take them to the countryside. You see a big mountain and a big river. You see so many, you see the huge banyan tree and we see the different planets in the sky. People are, and they can, they're understanding, oh, there's some, there's some power behind this. Prabhupada writes how sometimes the Aboriginal people or tribal people, they will offer their obeisances, they will offer respect. If there's an eclipse, they think, oh, this is very, this is a very deep significance to them. And certainly there is significance to it, but they take it as a, some kind of uh, omen to, to them. And they would be very respectful to a big banyan tree and a huge mountain, a volcano, things like that. So these are all different aspects of nature. And for more thoughtful people, we'll understand there's some personality behind all of this nature. In the beginning, just as our, the Madhiji said, for people who are neophyte, who have not, who are, they're not able to understand the transcendental form of the Lord, they need to practice seeing God through the material world through the material energy. So we're given some descriptions here in these verses. All the different phenomena, different features of the world, they're all related to different parts of the body of the Lord. So text number two goes on. Two nostrils, the generating center for breathing, all and all other airs. His smelling powers generate the Ashwini Kumars and all kinds of medicinal herbs and his breathing energies produce different kinds of fragrance. His eyes are the generating center of all kinds of forms. They glitter and illuminate his eyeballs are like the sun and the heavenly planets. His ears hear from all sides and are receptacles for all the Vedas. So hearing, very important part of Krishna consciousness. Vedic knowledge has to be heard. So the sense of hearing is vital. And then the eye, from the Brahma Samhita we know about the eye, right, being the, 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 the sun, right? You know that verse in the Brahma Samhita describing about the sun? Yes, go ahead. Okay, very good then. 
Okay, thank you. Yes. So like that, the sun, the king of all planets, is like the eye of the Lord. So this is also described here for us. Okay, going ahead. We come up to if we come up to text number six, there's an important uh, purport here. Prabhupada says actually the verse is important. He said this important verse of Srimad Bhagavatam is corroborated and nicely explained in the Bhagavad Gita. And then Prabhupada quotes the last two verses of the tenth chapter. You know, after studying Bhakti Shastri, you remember the tenth chapter describing the vibhutis of the Lord. And then at the end of the chapter, then Lord Krishna says, oh Arjuna, what need is there for all of this detailed knowledge? With a single fragment of myself, I pervade and support the entire creation. Right? And so that fragment of Krishna, what is that? Pervading, supporting the entire creation. Who is that? The Paramatma. Yes, right. The super soul, the Paramatma. Thank you. So the Lord is pervading the whole creation in here. This verse is actually speaking about the, the great demigods and other leaders who protect the general mass. And Prabhupada goes through a long list. He gives, he mentions many different powerful leaders and heads of society. Hmm. All of them are different powerful parts and parcels of the Lord. The Supreme Lord, Sri Krishna, is the father of all living entities who are placed in different high and low positions according to their natural aspiration, according to their desires or aspirations. So we see everyone according to our desires and aspirate according to our ability, the Lord puts us into different situations. Some people are put into positions of leadership and others are just ordinary common people. They don't have so much responsibility. But the origin of all of these powers is actually coming from the Lord himself. And Prabhupada writes there, as long as the powerful men of the world do not accept the origin of their respective powers, namely the personality of Godhead, the actions of Maya will continue to act. So it's very important that everyone understands whatever powers we have, it is simply due to the grace of the Lord. And it's not actually our doing, but it's the gifts of the Lord. He's given some people an opportunity to take some power, to have some power, and to have some position. He's giving everyone a chance to do something according to their particular qualification. And Prabhupada emphasizes this again. He says, the intelligent class of men, therefore, must admit the Lord as the ultimate source of all energies and thus pay tribute to the Lord for his good blessings. So we have to recognize whatever we've got, it's, it's his blessings. And it's very important for us to be satisfied with whatever, with whatever the Lord bestows on us. Not to be always dissatisfied, anxious to increase, to do, but rather we should appreciate how merciful, how kind Lord Krishna is. So that will give us peace of mind. Prabhupada then goes on speaking about the importance of peace in the purport. So this is a point to recognize how the Lord is 
controlling everything and everyone, and he's ordaining for different people the due results of the fruit of their activities. Hmm? So text 7 goes on to speak more about the different positions of the planets and upper, lower and heavenly planets as well as for all that we need. His lotus feet serve as protection from all kinds of fear. Fear is something which we need to hear about. The nature of material life is fear. We're all fearful. We have a lot of fears. Many di we're fearful of many different... We're not just fearful of death. We're fearful of old age. Some people are fearful their hair is going to go grey. Some people are fearful their hair is going to fall out. Somebody's fearful their, their business is going to collapse. Somebody is fearful they're going to get divorced. The marriage is not going to work out. Like that, there's so many fears which you have in material life. It's part of the material world. But we have to learn to take shelter of the Supreme Lord and He can free us from all this fear. There's no need for us to be so, for us to be so fearful. We have to conquer over fear. And the, the only way you can actually overcome this fear is by taking shelter of Lord Krishna, by taking shelter of his lotus feet. Right? Maybe you know that verse. Prabhupada was in the hospital, you know, in New York when he'd first gone to America. The, Prabhupada had some heart problem. A devotee took him to the hospital and... At one point, the doctor brought this huge needle and he, they stuck it into Prabhupada. And after they took it out and went away, one of the devotees asked Prabhupada, was it painful, Prabhupada? And Prabhupada looked at the devotee and said, he quoted the verse, maybe you know that verse, you know? Samasritaye padapalavam papam mahatpadam that for one who has accepted the shelter of the lotus feet of the Supreme Lord, then the ocean of the material existence becomes as insignificant as the water contained in the footprint in the in the hoofprint of a car. And the, the, the devotee's destination is the spiritual world. The devotee's not going to stay in the material world because he knows this material world, there's simply danger in every step, right? That's the point, the danger in every step in the material world. But for devotees, there's no danger because they've taken shelter of Krishna. Devotees are not in, danger, in any fear, or they shouldn't be in any fear, because we understand. We are under the protection of Lord Krishna. We have the shelter of the lotus feet of the Lord. There's nothing to fear. We have to have that faith. Right? Have you all got that faith? I hope so. Okay, so the chapter goes on. We hear more about different parts of the universal form. The Lord's genitals originate water. Simon, generate, Simon generates rains and the procreators. His genitals are the cause of a pleasure that counteracts the distress of begetting. It may be puzzling to people, the, the distress of begetting. We are think, most people think it's a pleasure to have a child. 
you know. But here it talks about the distress of begetting. Well, Krishna is very clever that he counteracts that distress, that fear which is in people's mind. Oh, oh, another child. Oh, a child. Do we want a child? Sometimes like that, people have that fear. One, one person who recently became a devotee, he told me how before he became a devotee, his wife had conceived a child. So they already had one child. So he asked his mother-in-law what she thought. And she said, well, well, if it's another boy, oh, it will be so much trouble to take care of. She said, a girl, girls are a bit more peaceful, but a boy is uh, a lot of trouble to take care of. So then he asked his, his wife's mother, in other words, his mother-in-law, and she said, oh, no, not another child. She said, I don't think I can handle taking care of it. So the result was his wife had an abortion. So that's kind of the common situation in the world today, around the world. We get this, that people are in fear, Having, having children, they don't like the idea of bringing up children. But we should understand it's a wonderful service to do, to bring up, to bring children into the world and to raise them to become devotees of Lord Krishna. It's a very wonderful duty and very much appreciated by the Lord. Of course, it's a very difficult task to bring children into the world. It's difficult enough. I know so many couples who wanted a child, somehow they couldn't get a child. And those people who did get children, it's very difficult to bring them, to keep them in Krishna consciousness. And that's a challenge. Although you may try to, to do everything, Prabhupada's own children, Prabhupada would bring them to the temple and so on. But once they grew up, they were not too much interested in Krishna consciousness. They just wanted to have a normal life. <laughs> normal life meant just, you know, enjoy material life. They didn't think about any higher purpose. All right, and then Brahma then takes nine, goes on to talk about nasty places, the backside of the Lord, the evacuating hole, the, rep, the rectum of the Lord. It's a place of envy, misfortune, death, hell, Prabhupada was traveling in a flight in the USA and at one point the, the pilot on one of these flights was very nice and he came and spoke to Prabhupada and he was, Prabhupada said he was a very intelligent man. He was asking Prabhupada questions and he asked Prabhupada about where does evil come from? So Srila Prabhupada explained to him, just like it's described here, he said, evil is the backside of the Lord. Just like the, the sun is in the front, so you can turn away from the sun, you can turn your back to the sun. You don't see the sun. So the same way there's good, there's also evil. So everything comes from, from God. There's nothing independent of God. Good comes from Him and evil also comes from Him. So this is described here. And then goes on to hear, we hear about the bones are like the mountains and the rivers are like the veins. Nice examples. Uh, 
text 11 speaks about the impersonal feature, the oceans, his belly, the place for materially annihilated living entities. His heart is the abode of the subtle material bodies of living beings. Thus it is known by the intelligent class of men. So the, in the Lord's heart, who is in the heart of the Lord? Who would be in the Lord's heart? Yes, right. The Lord says, devotees are in my heart. And who is in the hearts of the devotees? Of course, the Lord. So there's that reciprocation. Here, described a little different, the abode, his heart is the abode of the subtle material bodies of living beings. So, the subtle body of the living beings. I always seem to have this karma. Whenever I give a class, they start these really noisy machines. Can you hear it in the background there? You're okay? Huh? It's okay? Okay, we'll tolerate it. Huh? All right, so then text 12 goes on to speak about the four Kumaras, bachelors, and about their consciousness. And that consciousness is the abode of truth and transcendental knowledge. And then we go, go on to hear about the Lord, how his size is not more than nine inches. As the super soul, he expands by his potency in the shape of the universal form. And the universal forms including everything. So this is the wonder of the Supreme Lord. And this is the teachings we get that Everything is Krishna, and at the same time, Krishna is different from everything. Everything rests on the energy of Lord Krishna, but at the same time, the Lord is different from everything. He remains always transcendental. We have to understand how perfect the creation of the Lord is. We are given the example how He is Purnam, everything. And we, of course, we recite from the invocation of the Ishopanishad, Prabhupada put, put, put that invocation that Om Purnam Adakunam. That Purnam indicates the, the perfect nature of the creation of the Lord that everything animate and inanimate is, is, is all created by the Lord, it's all perfect. Everything is here for our maintenance. There's no deficit, everything is provided. And so that's a, the perfect nature of the creation. So by studying the universe, we can understand how perfect the creation is 
And we should understand that behind that creation, there's a creator. That it's not just simply by chance, but there's a personality behind it. It's all under Him. And we should think how foolish these people are who, who fail to recognize the existence of God. That they say, oh, everything just came from a big bang, or it just came out of the black hole, or as the Buddhists say, it's all illusion, nothing is real. And so, so many foolish theories. But to a devotee, it's so obvious that there's a personality in this world, that there's a person behind this world, a, and he's the perfect person, and he, he is the person responsible for this whole creation. So after describing some features of the universal form, then Lord Brahma goes in to describe more about the Lord Himself, about the particular energies of the Lord. In text 17, we hear about the internal and the external energy of the Sun. And he said, in the same way, the personality of Godhead expands this universal form, maintains everything in the creation, both internally and externally. Internally, it's maintaining everything as the Lord Himself, and externally, in the form of the different demigods. Reading from Prabhupada's purport, Prabhupada says, So the universal form of the Lord is the secondary imagination of the impersonal form of the Lord. But the primary form of the Lord is Shamsundar, with two hands, playing on his eternal flute. Seventy-five percent of the expansive radiation of the Lord is manifested in the spiritual sky, Tripad Vibhuti, and 25% of His personal radiation comprehends the entire expansion of the material universe. So we're hearing about the Tripad Vibhuti and the Ekapad the booty. Two different features of the Lord's energy. The Tripad Vibhuti represents the spiritual potency and the Ekapad Vibhuti is the material potency. So the spiritual potency that is what Shakti of the Lord? I thought it would be the Chit. Chit Shakti. You think some of it? And what potency is the material world, the Ekapad Vibhuti? That is which Shakti? Maya Shakti. Maya Shakti, right. Maya Shakti. So the Maya Shakti and in the spiritual world we have the Chit Shakti. And the living entities, we are the Tatasta Shakti. And we are in between. Prabhupada explains, the living entities, in the purport, text 19, the living entities who are residents of the spiritual 
as well as the material expansions, are his marginal energy, and they are at liberty to live in either of the energies externally or internally. Those who live within the spiritual expansion of the Lord are called liberated souls, whereas the residents of the external expansions are called conditioned souls. We can just make an estimate of the number of the residents of the internal expansion in comparison with the number of residents of the, in the external energy, and may easily conclude that the liberated souls are far more numerous than the conditioned souls. So Prabhupada's pointing out to us to remind us, we are the minority, we are very small, we are the prisoners in the material world. Just like in every country they will have the prison house and most of the people are free. But within the prison there is a few rebellious souls who are placed in the prison house. So similarly we are the conditioned souls. We are the one-fourth of the energy of the Lord placed in this ekapat vibhuti. And the spiritual sky, there are many, many more planets, many, many more living entities who are all free, who are all enjoying in the spiritual world. Right? What's it? The three energies in the spiritual sky? There are three, po there, just as there are three modes in the material world, so there are also three potencies in the spiritual world. Yes, Sambit, Santini, and Ladini. Right. Hmm. The material world is goodness, passion, and ignorance. So the spiritual sky, those souls in the spiritual world, they enjoy under the spiritual potency. They enjoy full freedom because they are fully dedicated to the service of the Supreme Lord. However, those souls in the material world, we are the prisoners. We are here placed in this world to reform. So from text 18, Prabhupada says, It is said that those planets in the spiritual sky, which comprise the 75% expansion of the internal potency of the Lord, are far, far greater than those planets in the total universe composed of the external potency of the Lord. The comparison between the two regions is given for some uh, length in the purport here. Prabhupada is explaining, would someone like to bring up some of the points? What are some of the main differences between the spiritual world and the material world. In text number 18, what are the main points there which Prabhupada is bringing up from the purport? Yes. Why you say the, the board death cycle is uh, there in a part of it's not there in three part of it. Nature of the soul. What is there in the egg, egg pada, not in the tree pada? The egg pada, the birth cycle, the issue circle of birth and death. Birth and death, okay, yes. In tree 
Right. Tripada, there is no birth in death. Yes. Sorry. In material world, there is always anxiety and fearfulness in the heart of all living entities. All right. But, but in spiritual world, fearlessness, because of the Supreme Father is there with us. Yes. They're enjoying without anxiety, without fear. In Father is forgetfulness, avidya, and. The material, in the material world, we are forgetful, we are in avidya, in ignorance of our relationship with the Lord. And in the spiritual world, what is the situation? Yes, right. In the spiritual world, everyone is in full knowledge. They're remembering their very relationship. Everything is dedicated for the service of the Lord. Here is Niranand. Right? No bliss. And there is Anand. Our world is Asat. There's is Sat. And there's is Chit. Ours is Achit. So material world is the opposite of the spiritual world. I'm sorry, Prabhu, I, I can't quite hear everything you're saying. So, in the material world, there is always the influence of time which changes things from one stage to another. In the spiritual world, there is no time. Alright, the influence of time is absent in the spiritual world. In, due to the influence of time, everything degrades, everything deteriorates. And due to the influence of time in the material world, we see our bodies age. So what about in the spiritual world? What happens? The people age? Hmm? Is there old age in the spiritual world? Do people get old? No. There is no effect of age. Eternal youthfulness. Eternal youthful, yes, right. They enjoy eternal youth. No old age. No disease? Yes, no disease, no doctor's bills. In the Bhutin, the controller is required to be, and she gives three parts uh, to the living entities according to the Prarabdha and the Sarma. But in the material, in the spiritual world, there is uh, no three parts, there is all enjoyment. Okay. So, Prabhupada spoke about something about this uh, Brahma-Bhut. The, the, the nature of the spiritual world, they, they enjoy spiritual bliss. But we, because of our material bodies and because of our identification with the material world, we cannot experience that. Yes, anything else? Prabhupada also mentions that in the material world, 
we have to work very hard to get a little bit of happiness. And but in the spiritual world, happiness is the nature of spirit, so it's full of happiness. Oh. Yeah, you don't even have to try for it. It's just by nature, it's just life is just joyful there, every moment. But as you say, in material life, we have to work very hard for a little happiness in the material world. So Prabhupada writes here at the end of the purport, spiritual happiness in the eternal kingdom of God cannot be imagined even by the great brahmacharis or sannyasis who are eligible to be promoted to the planets beyond the region of heaven. Or the greatness of the Supreme Lord is so great that it cannot be imagined even by the great brahmacharis or sannyasis. But such happiness is factually attained by the unalloyed devotees of the Lord, by His divine grace. Okay, going ahead, text number 20 again, or oh, 19, Prabhupada still, well, Lord Brahma is still speaking about the, the comparison between the spiritual world and the material world. It says, deathlessness, fearlessness and freedom from the anxieties of old age and disease exist. Exist in the kingdom of God, which is beyond the higher planetary system and beyond the material covering. So if we want to get beyond fear and death and we want to be free from all the anxiety, we have to go beyond the coverings of the universe. It's not enough to just go to heaven. It's not enough just to go to the higher planets. We have to go beyond that. And Prabhupada talks about the different planets, Swarga, Marcia Loka. Well, Matya and Patala Loka, they're lower planets, but higher planets, Swarga, heaven. But you have to enter into the Vaikuntha planets in order to get really free of the, cover, the, the suffering. Even in the higher planets, no one is free from the suffering. Even you go all the way up, he mentions about Mahar Loka. Mahar Loka, that's above Swarga Loka. You have Jana Loka, Mahar Loka, Tapa Loka, and then, then Brahma Loka or Satya Loka. And so even you go up to Mahar Loka, there's a fear. There's going to be annihilation. You have to go to higher planets. So anxiety is everywhere in the material universe, this is the point. Even you go all the way up to these higher planets, even Lord Brahma, he has to worry about giving up his post and leaving his position there as the creator of the material universe. He has to worry about that also, not just us. Even Lord Brahma has to worry about it. In text 20, the Lord's energy, uh, the spiritual world, consisting of three fourths of the Lord's energy, is situated beyond this material world, and it is especially meant for those who will never be reborn. Others are attached to family life and who do not strictly follow celibacy vows must live within the three material worlds. So there's some discussion here about 
the benefits of practicing celibacy. The highest benefit that can be awarded to a human being is to train him to be detached from sex life, particularly because it is only due to sex indulgence that the conditional life of material existence continues birth after birth. But as long as the bodily attachment for sensual enjoyment is encouraged, the individual spirit soul is forced to continue the repetition of birth and death on account of the material body, which is compared to garments subjected to the law of deterioration. Any form of religious principle in which the followers are trained to pursue the vow of celibacy is good for the human being because only those who are trained in that way can end the miserable life of material existence. And then Prabhupada talks about Buddhists and how they practice nirvana. Of course, Buddhist monks, they're meant to practice strict celibacy. And even you see in the, the Christian church, the Catholic priests, they also take vows of celibacy. Of course, it's very difficult for them. You know, there's always a lot of agitation in the Catholic Church. The priests want to get married, but at the same time they want to remain priests, and it's not allowed in the Catholic Church. So they're always trying, there's always people trying to reform. They, the, the priests want to marry, they want to marry, but they're not allowed to. The Church doesn't allow it. So it's actually very difficult for them to practice celibacy because they don't follow any rules. They eat all kinds of, you know, animal flesh and they drink also wine and other alcohols and they, they, they do things like gambling. They don't follow any religious principles hardly, but they're supposed to practice celibacy. They eat meat, they take intoxication. It's so very difficult for them to try to practice celibacy. But if people are trained in Krishna consciousness from the beginning, then it's much easier. If, if from the beginning of life, people are taught the basic principles, then it's much easier. So Prabhupada talks about the Buddhists, the Shankarites and the Vaishnavites. Vaishnavite, they all uh, talk about the, the value of abstinence from the associate associating intimately with the opposite sex. So, but in the spiritual world it comes up. A Buddhist monk was asking me about what is the nature of the spiritual world. He had heard us talking about the spiritual world. So he was a Buddhist. You know, in Buddhism they have the the Western world. And in Buddhism, there's no men and there's no women. There's only Buddha. So you go to the spiritual world, everyone is a Buddha. There's no male, there's no female. So he asked me, how is it in Krishna consciousness, in the spiritual world? Do you have men and women? So I told him, yeah. I said, there are men and women and people are even married. They have their wives. But they're, they're very peaceful. They're very happy. They're not controlled by sex. Because they experience the higher pleasure. They experience Krishna consciousness. They've purified their mind and senses. 
they're able to enter into the spiritual world and they can live together peacefully. Not like in the material world where people are just servants of the senses. So it's very different. You can see we have a very perfect philosophy If everyone is a Buddha, then what do they do there? <laughs> They're all Buddhas. Nobody's, everyone's a master, no one's a servant. <laughs> I can't imagine how they all managed to live together. Okay, any comments so far? Anyone has any questions or comments? Maharaj, I have a question. Yes, Prabhu. Uh, Maharaj, uh, in uh, verse 13 to 16, uh, Prabhupada has mentioned in the translation that the size of Paramatma is not exceeding 9 inches. Yes. Uh, just trying to understand uh, uh, about this, because uh, uh, is, uh, whose reference to this 9 inches is not known? Because uh, there are so many living entities which are very minute in size. Uh, in, in their body, in this material world. So how to understand Paramatma's feature in, within their heart with the nine inches? How to understand this? We would understand it in relation to the, in proportion to the body. That the human body has super soul according to, to the, the, the heart there will be a particular size of super soul. Of course, somebody has a, a very tiny body, tiny insects, they also have the super soul. So what size will be the super soul? How do we understand? The, the, the nine inches is in proportion to the body of the living entity. And uh, also, Maharaj, it is mentioned eternally existing. means uh, in the spiritual world, Paramatma's uh, feature is in the nine inches, how to... In the spiritual the world, there is no super soul. Yeah. Then uh, how to understand it's eternally existing? It's eternally existing in the material world, under the external energy and external potency of the Lord. At the time of the annihilation, the super soul will... Just like we have Vaikuntha planet, Dhruva Maharaj's planet is Vaikuntha planet, right? It's not annihilated at the time of the annihilation. It remains. Everything enters into Mahavishnu and Dhruva's planet remains. And when there's a creation, then Dhruva's planet is there again. So similarly, the super soul. We have Sweta Dweep. Sweta Dweep, well, Shirodakashai Vishnu is residing there. So the Paramatma is expanded from Sweta Dweep, from the Lord on Sweta Dweep, Shirodakashai Vishnu. And so everything enters into the, the one form of Shirodakashai Vishnu at Sweta Dweep. And then with, again with creation, then the super souls enter into the heart of all living entities. Universal form is mentioned, but when in Bhagavad Gita we study that universal, we learn that the universal form spreads everywhere. There's no beginning, no end, no middle. The universal form, yeah, you know, well, the universal form is material, right? It's material yeah. in that sense that it's, that it's created, but the elements of creation. Because it's the Lord's energy, it's all eternal, all right? The Lord's prakriti is eternal. And it's just sometimes it's manifest and sometimes it's not. So Prabhupada gave the example, he said, just like clouds, you see clouds in the sky. Sometimes you see the cloud and sometimes they're not there. They're just not manifest. So the same way the Lord's prakriti, this uh, inferior prakriti, Sometimes it's manifest and sometimes it's not. So the universal form, of, of course the universal form is subtle, it's not 
it's not a gross form, it's subtle, but sometimes it's manifest, sometimes it's not. At the time of the annihilation, then it's an unmanifest form. Hmm? Why in this yoga it's mentioned universal form, why not super soul is mentioned only because universal form is spread everywhere and, uni and super soul is eight to nine in Yeah, the super soul was mentioned eight to nine inches. Why is the universal form not mentioned? Here in this uh, in this verse, universal form uh, of the Lord is mentioned. Right. And why not super soul is mentioned? Because super soul is eight to nine inches, and and the universal form is uh, is all is all all pervading, all spreading me. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> How do you measure the universal form? Yeah. Prabhupada brings up that point. He said, you know, when we talk about the universe, how, how can we have devotion for the universal form? You can't address it. Hmm? Yeah. So that's, that's the problem with the universal form. But the, Prabhupada also explains that there's no real purpose in contemplating the universal form unless it brings out the mood of service. We have to take up the mood of service to the Supreme. You know, people go and they look at nature and they say, oh, God is great, oh, but they don't do anything, they don't do any service. They appreciate nature, it's like Shantaras. Shantaras, you appreciate the beauty of the Lord, but you don't do any service. So people appreciate, they, they like to look at nature, oh, the countryside, oh, the beach, the ocean, the stars. They're thinking, so wonderful, so nice to see everything, but they don't do any service. They don't take up any practical activity. So the real purpose in contemplating the universal form is that we will want to serve the Lord. We will understand that behind that universal form, there is a creator. There's a personality behind that universal form. And that personality of Godhead is superior to the universal form. And this is an important point which should come out from this section, that we want to understand that the Lord is superior to the universal form and we should take up service for the Supreme Lord. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes, Prabhu. Uh, please, uh, I need your assistance to be able to understand this purport in text 20 where it is mentioned or the glorification of a celebrity. And then Prabhupada goes further to say in the book for the householders and persons who have deliberately broken the vow of celibacy cannot enter into the kingdom of deathlessness. Means householders are sure not to take to go to the spiritual world. I don't I I, I find it difficult to understand it. Well, he doesn't say that. He doesn't say all householders, but he, he explains, he said, the pious householders or the fallen yogis or the fallen transcendentalists can be promoted to the highest planets within the material world, but they will fail to enter into the kingdom of deathlessness. But then Prabhupada continues, the Vanaprastas or those retired from family life, the sannyasis, the renounce, they cannot break the vow of celibacy if they want success in the process. And so then Prabhupada talks about the fall down and then he says, in good families of learned brahmanas or of rich merchants, for the for, uh, they get another term of elevation, but the best thing is to attain the highest perfection, deathlessness. So the idea is 
you're in householder life don't be in grihamedi life right there's a grihasta ashram and grihamedi life a grihamedi lives in householder life just for his sense gratification but if you're actually grihasta then krishna is in the center of the house and it's a, it's a life of control the, the, there's control over the senses we see the mahajans most of the mahajans are householders so we shouldn't think that being a householder means you're fallen we have swambu narada shambu swambu brahma is a householder lord brahma is speaking and shambu lord shiva is a householder the pralado janako bishmo pralada janaka both householders bali vyasaki vaya bali maharaj a householder and Yamaraj the household, you know, they're all great Mahajans. They're the authorities in devotional service. They're in householder life. So why? Why you're worried? You follow their example. Mahajano Yenagatapat Sapanta. Follow in the footsteps of the Mahajans. And these Mahajans are all mentioned. And several of them are householders. So there's no problem. But don't be a Grihamedi, that's the point. And don't be, a, and, and Grihamedis, they're probably better off than the fallen sannyasis. If somebody's a sannyasi and he's in Maya and addicted to illicit connection, then his position is much worse. Right? Grihe dako vani dako sabahari boli dako. Lord Ch Narottam Das Thakur says, it doesn't matter if you're in family life or if you're renounced life. If you're a devotee, I want your association. And Lord Chaitanya took the association of Ramananda Rai. Ramananda Rai was in family life. But when Lord Chaitanya met him, Ramanan Lord Chaitanya questioned Ramananda Rai. And he told Ramananda Rai, if you know the science of Krishna, and then you can become guru. Srila Bhaktivinoda Thakur was in family life. Look how many children he had. He is the seventh Goswami. So no, you, no problem. But don't be a great lady. That's the point. Be a transcendentalist. Okay, we have to cut them. Yes, Maharaji? Okay. Maharaj, can we think that, like the connection between a voice and fire is said because the universal form is connected with the material, um, like more with the materialist people further. So, whenever these materialist people speak, the fire only comes from their mouth because they will speak nonsense and materialist talk only. That is like fire and so. <laughs> The voice is okay, that's a, that's a good uh, a good uh, speculation. <laughs> I don't know, but it's certainly quite realistic what you say that they speak like fire. Sometimes we say they speak like thunder, voices like thunder. When Krishna, Lord Krishna, went with Bhima and Arjuna to see Jarasandha. And they were dressed as brahmanas but jarasandha thought these people couldn't be brahmanas they, their voices were like thunder because they were kshatriyas the kshatriyas so they speak very powerfully and authoritatively so sometimes people with voices like thunder sometimes their words may be like fire they burn okay going ahead text 21 we hear about the energies of the Lord. He's the master of both nations and factual knowledge. All right, so we hear about the uh, forgetfulness of the living entity described in the second paragraph of the purport. And because the living entity is partially cognizant, he is therefore sometimes forgetful of his own identity. 
This forgetfulness is specifically manifest in the field of the Ekapadvibhuti of the Lord or in the material world. But in the Tripadvibhuti field of actions or in the spiritual world, there is no forgetfulness by the living entities who are free from all kinds of contamination resulting from the forgetful state of existence. All right, so we we forget. That's the problem. That forgetfulness, that is the avidya. And then, then Prabhupada talks about the different stages of avidya in the form of dharma, artha, and kama and moksha. And of course, their idea of moksha is just becoming one with the Lord. So like that we understand the position of the spiritual world compared to the material world. The Lord is thus the proprietor. At the end of the purport of 21, the Lord is thus the proprietor of the fields, both of nations and of cognition, and remains the choice of the living and it remains the choice of the living entity to exist in either of the above regions. Krishna gives us independence. He doesn't force us. We choose. Where do we want to be? We are responsible. Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, I am not responsible for the sins or the pious activities of people. They do it themselves. So we suffer and enjoy according to our own actions. Krishna gives us independence. Alright, now we're going to hear about the Lord and his situation. Uh, in text 22, it's described here, just reading to you. The Ekapadvibhuti manifestation of the material energy is just like one of the many mistresses of the Lord but whom the Lord is not so much attracted as indicated in the language of the Gita, Bina Prakriti, but the region of the Tripad Vibhuti being a pure spiritual manifestation of the energy of the Lord is, so to speak, more attractive to Him. So the Lord has His own attraction, what, what's attractive to Him? He expands himself as a gigantic form of the Vishwarup. The Vishwarup, as it was shown to Arjuna, is not the original form of the Lord. The original form of the Lord is a transcendental form of Purushottama or Krishna himself. It is very nicely explained here. He expands himself just like the sun. The sun expands itself by its terrible heat and rays, yet the sun is always aloof from such rays and heat. And then Prabhupada talks about how the impersonalists see everything. They consider the rays of the Lord without any information of the actual form of the Lord. They don't understand that the, the rays of the Lord have to come from somewhere. There's a planet where everything comes from. And the same way everything that we see in this world, it comes from someone. And Prabhupada quotes a verse from Brahma Samhita, Ananda Chinmaya Rasa Pratibhavi Tabi, Tabiriya Eva Nijarupa Kaya Kalabi. Right? That everything, that although Krishna is in Goloka, He's present in every nook and corner of the universe, in each and every universe. He's present everywhere by his different potencies, by his different energy. So then text 23, Lord Brahma begins to speak about his birth 
and about how he felt the need for sacrifice, that he's taken his birth and he understands the purpose of life, that there's, there's, there should be some sacrifice, that he should want to do something for the, the person who's produced him, who's created him. We want to sacrifice for, for others. And in the purport, Prabhupada talks about animal sacrifices. But this is not Brahma's intention. Brahma also wants to do sacrifice. But the, the problem was, described in text 23, there were no ingredients except the bodily limbs of the personality of Godhead. So how to do sacrifice? You have to get some, there has to be the different things to perform sacrifice. You have to have ghee, you have to have fruit, flowers, you have to have priests and so many different things are needed to do a yagya, right? Whenever we have a yagya, we know what's involved, all the procedures and preparation. So Lord Brahma is thinking about doing sacrifice. He wants to make an offering, do something to satisfy the Lord by His yagya. But where to get the materials? Prabhupada writes in the purport, nothing is created out of nothing, but everything is created from the person of the Lord. And then Prabhupada quotes Bhagavad Gita 10, verse number 8, how Krishna is the source of everything. And then Prabhupada brings up the impersonalists, the, the impersonalists, how they argue that there's no need to worship God. They say everything is nothing. Everything is God Himself, so God doesn't need to worship God. <laughs> That's what they would say. But Prabhupada said a devotee will worship God out of a sense of gratitude. He will use whatever comes from the body of the Lord in the service of the Lord. And Prabhupada gives an example, just like you take some water when you take bath in the Ganges, you take the water of the Ganges in your hand and you offer it back to the Ganges. That is the procedure. So the same way the devotee takes whatever the Lord provides and we offer it, we use it in the service of the Lord. That is the perfect sacrifice. Sometimes we give the example, you find some money in the street. The karmi will take the money for his own sense gratification. The jnani will leave it there. He will say, maya, don't touch it. But the devotee will take the money and he'll use it for the service of Krishna. He'll go and buy fruits and flowers to offer to Krishna. Or he'll put the money in the donation box for the service of the temple. Something like that. So we have different visions about everything. There's a vision of the devotee and the, vi the, the vision of the impersonalist. Okay, text 25 describes the different kinds of people, four different kinds of people who perform sacrifice. You're going to do a yagya. Usually you don't just do it on your own. There should be somebody who can make the off who does the offerings. Somebody who chants the mantras, somebody who kindles the fire, and then somebody who is the supervisor. So at least four people should be there. Four brahmanas should be there to do the yagya. But in our Kali Yuga, we don't have to worry. Our yagya is much easier. We will do the Sankirtan yagya. Kali Yuga Dharma Harinam Sankirtan Krishna Shakti Vininahi Tara Pravartana 
Right? Chaitanya Charitamrita says in the Kali Yuga, the Dharma is the chanting of the holy name. Yarnavai Vishnu, Harinam Sankirtan. Chanting of the holy name. That is the real sacrifice for the Kali Yuga. However, the, the birth of Brahma, with Brahma appearing from the lotus flower, he is doing a different sacrifice. Kali Yuga, we didn't have any Brahmanas to chant the holy name, to chant the Vedic mantras. But Lord Brahma, he can chant. He's there in the Satya Yuga, the beginning of the age. So he's able to do all these things. So we hear about the different necessities being produced for the service of the Yajna. Text 20, 27, Lord Brahma said, I had to arrange all the necessary ingredients and paraphernalia of sacrifice from the personal bodily parts of the personality of Godhead. By invocation of the demigod names, the ultimate goal, Vishnu, was gradually attained. And this compensation and ultimate offering were complete. So Brahma is describing how he was able to do the yajna. He chanted the names of the demigods, then came to the ultimate goal, Vishnu. This is the, the Vedic system. They will worship the demigods, then come to the goal, Vishnu. We go directly to worship Vishnu. We don't worship the demigods. We don't want to get confused and lost. We go straight to the Supreme Lord. Prabhupada says in the purport of 27, Human life is thus made successful by pleasing Narayan and getting entrance into the direct association of Narayan in the spiritual kingdom of Vaikuntha. So we, if we worship, begin to worship different demigods, we can easily go off track. You get confused. Prabhupada was very clear. Just keep away, keep them out. Okay, so Lord Brahma is doing the yajna and the enjoyer and the enjoyer of the sacrifice is the Supreme Lord. But at the same time Lord Brahma had to take the different items for performing the yajna. He took everything from the body of the Lord, from the Lord's creation. So he's satisfying the Lord with what is actually his. Another example Prabhupada would often give is how a little child may get money from his parents and then he goes and buys something to give a present to his parents. And so the money was, it came from the parents but the child brought the gift and gave it to the parents. Will the parents be pleased? Yes, yeah, certainly they'll be pleased. That, oh, my little child has brought this present for me, how nice. They will appreciate so much. So the same way, in this world, we take everything, which is actually Krishna's, it's all his property, and we're offering it back to him for his pleasure, for his enjoyment. All right, so we hear more. Uh, text number 30. Uh, So the, the Supreme Lord, he's a maintainer, but by the will of the Lord, Brahma is empowered that he can create and Shiva can destroy. They're given these different powers. This is the arrangement of the Lord. He doesn't like to do everything himself, so he empowers his agents like Brahma and Shiva to do things on his behalf.
that's described in text number 32. Brahma is saying, he creates, Shiva destroys, but it's all done under the direction of the Supreme Lord, Vishnu, or Garbhodakashaya Vishnu, who is actually being recognized here in this as the Purusha Shukta. The Lord who is being worshipped by the Purusha Shukta is actually Garbhodakashaya Vishnu, and Lord Brahma is offering his prayers. Of course, Lord Brahma, he's born from the lotus flower, which comes from Garbhodakshaya Vishnu's navel. So he's the worshipable deity of Lord Brahma. Okay then, the chapter goes on, text 33, we begin to hear more about Brahma explaining that Lord Vishnu's potencies are inconceivable and nobody can actually estimate them. They're beyond everyone's power of understanding. Brahma's talking to Narada, my dear son, whatever you inquire from me, I have explained unto you. You should know whatever there is, both in the material and spiritual world, is dependent on the Supreme Lord. So this is Brahma's realization. He's understood there's nothing independent of the Lord. He's it's not like Narada. Narada was thinking his father was the Supreme Lord, but Lord Brahma is pointing out to him that he, Lord Brahma, he meditates on the Supreme Lord, who is far above him and far beyond his power of even of understanding. So Lord Brahma is describing how we have to take shelter of the Lord and how we have to approach Him. In text 34, He describes how we should perform this devotional service. He said, with great zeal, with great zeal, we should, in other words, we should be very enthusiastic and very energetic and very eager for every opportunity to engage in the Lord's service. And Lord Brahma describes the effect, the benefits of being engaged in the service of the Lord. He said that my senses are never degraded by temporary attachment to matter, nor is the progress of my mind ever deterred. And whatever I say has never proved to have been false. So this is the power of engaging in devotional service of the Lord. Brahma is experiencing that, the benefits that everything, because he's dedicated himself to the Lord, so everything he says is the absolute truth. And he's speaking the words of the scriptures. And we see, we read the Brahma Samhita. And Lord, what does Lord Brahma say? Govinda Madi Pursham Tamaham Bajami. So Lord Brahma, he, he, whatever he says, there's no fault, it's the absolute truth. And his mind is always fixed in the service of the Lord. His senses are never degraded by attachment to the matter. So this, this is the result of being fully situated in Krishna Consciousness. That we will be protected. Whatever we try to do for the service of the Lord, it will be glorious. We may, be, we may not be successful, just like Lord Nityananda went to preach. On behalf of Lord Chaitanya, he went to Jagai and Madhai to preach. 
and he was not successful. But he made the attempt, and that attempt was glorious. Although in the first attempt he failed, in the second attempt he was successful. So a devotee is not discouraged. Rather, the attempt to serve Krishna is glorious. Even though we may not come up to the full standard of the great devotee, you know, we may not experience bhava or prema, but because we're making the attempt, that in itself is glorious. So we should be convinced about that. So Lord Brahma is telling Narada like this. Uh, Prabhupada said this is also a very important verse actually, text number 34. It's, anyone who is earnestly serious in heart and soul about being in intimate touch with the personality of Godhead in the relationship of loving service will always be infallible in words and action. So this is uh, very important to remember. But then Prabhupada con contrasts that. He said, on the other hand, if you're just mental speculation, If you're just a mental speculator, then what, what good will you get? You will not get anywhere. You're, everything will be just use, useless labor. So then Brahma talks about his own life. He said, I'm, I may be known as the great Brahma, and I did a lot of austerities, and I'm expert in mystic powers and self-realization. I'm recognized by the forefathers. They offered me obeisances. He said, but still I cannot understand him, that Lord who is the very source of my birth. So it doesn't matter how great you are and whatever material qualifications you may have, it's never enough to qualify you to actually know the Lord. This is the point. No materialist can actually understand the Lord. He only reveals himself to his devotees. And so Lord Brahma is urging everyone by these words, He's urging, urging and his son Narada, and of course we are coming in the line from Narada Muni, that we should all surrender to him. We should take shelter of the lotus feet of the Lord. <laughs> and, and then Lord Brahma continues in the next verse, in text 36. He said, he said, I may not know about the Lord. He said, the Lord even doesn't know about himself. He said, even the Lord himself is unable to estimate his own limits. Now, how is it possible the Lord cannot understand his own limits? The point is that he has, he knows himself, but then he expands himself because he's, he's always increasing and expanding his powers. So he expands himself a bit more and then he knows himself, but then he expands himself more. And then he not, comes to know himself, and then he's expanding himself more. It's going on continually. He's never able to fully understand, to know himself, because he, you never reach a static situation. The Lord's glories, the Lord's powers are always increasing, always expanding, like that. So even the Lord himself cannot know his own position. Then 37, neither Shiva nor, nor you nor I could know the limits of spiritual happiness. How can other demigods know it? Right? The Brahma, Shiva and 
uh, Narada, these are all Mahajans, they're great devotees. So these other demigods, you know, how can they know the Lord? They have, they're, they're not equal to people like Brahma and Shiva and Na Narada. You know, they're very, very great special personalities. The material demigods, oh, and the Swarga Loka and so on, you know, they're nothing compared to Brahma and Shiva and Narad. So we want to understand the supreme position of the Lord. So therefore Lord Brahma says in 38, offer, let us offer our obeisances unto that Lord whose incarnation and activities are chanted by us for glorification, though he can hardly be fully known as he is. So although we can't know him fully, it doesn't mean we shouldn't worship him. Of course, we should worship him according to our own ability, and we will realize whatever we can of him. And gradually, when the Lord is pleased with us, he can reveal more of himself to us, and the Lord can reveal that the process is revelation. It's the Lord reveals himself to us. It's not that we ourselves can go and directly perceive the Lord. The Lord has to reveal himself to us. Then we can actually understand him. But as, as we hear, he, he's always increasing. So you have to continually surrender more and more. It's an ongoing process. So there's no end to the process of devotional service. We have to continue our chanting more and more. So text 39 then continues. Mahavishnu. The Lord expands into his plenary portion as Mahavishnu and he creates this manifested cosmos, but he is unborn. The creation takes place in him and the material substance and manifestation are all himself. He maintains them for some time and absorbs them into himself again. So the material creation is just Describe the process of creation, then maintenance, and then annihilation. Everything comes out from the body of Mahavishnu, and after some time, then it all goes back in again into the body of Mahavishnu. This is the nature of the material world. And that process of creation that is just simply one breath of Mahavishnu. So we understand the material creation to be like this. The lifetime of Brahma, which we consider great, is just simply one breath of Mahavishnu. So Prabhupada talks a lot about the impersonalists and their conception of the creation, how they understand everything, how they see everything without form, and when we talk about form, they think it means impersonal forms. At the end of the purport of text 39, Prabhupada writes, So this Mahavishnu is the first incarnation in the creation. And from him all the universes are generated and all material manifestations are produced, one after another. The Kashyo Ocean is created by the Lord as a Mahatattva, as a cloud in the spiritual sky, and is only a part of his different manifestations. The spiritual sky is an expansion of his personal rays, and he is the Mahatattva cloud also. He lies down and generates the universes by his breathing, and again by entering into each universe as Garbhodakshayi Vishnu, he creates Brahma, Shiva, 
and many other demigods for maintenance of the universe and again absorbs the whole thing into his person as confirmed in the Bhagavad Gita. The conclusion is that these are all but displays of the Lord's inconceivable person, personal energies of which no one can have any full information. This point we have already discussed. So we can have some information, but we, we're not going to have full information. That is the point. We have to understand how limited we are to understand the Lord, the energy of the Lord. And if we're so limited to understand the Lord's energy, then how much more limited we are to understand the Lord Himself as a person, how He's so far beyond our ability to understand everything. So then Lord Brahma goes on in text 4041 to glorify the Supreme Lord, describing His qualities. And he's encouraging, then he encourages Narada that he should also take shelter of the Lord. The Prabhupada's purports are quite extensive on these things encouraging all of us to take to devotional service, to take the shelter of devotional service. We hear about Karanu Dakashai Vishnu in text 42, one of the Lord's Purusha avatars, the first Purusha avatar. Prabhupada writes in the purport there of 40, 41, 42, so the temporary creation of the material manifestation is an exhibition of the material energy of the Lord. And to manage the whole show, the Supreme Lord incarnates Himself as Karana Dakashai Vishnu, just as a magistrate is deputed by the government to manage affairs temporarily. This Karana Dakashai Vishnu causes the manifestation of material creation by looking over his material energy. So like that, the nice example Prabhupada gives, the magistrate and the government, the government put the man magistrate to and manage affairs. So the same way the Lord appoints Karana Dakashai Vishnu to look over the affairs of the material creation. Because as we heard, right, this material creation is not very dear to the Lord. Bina prakritir ashtada. That is his, his separated energy. So the Lord is not too much concerned. But nevertheless, it's his creation. And so he puts the magistrate here. Karana Dakashai Vishnu. And then we hear about Garbhodakashai Vishnu, goes on in the purport. Garbhodakashai Vishnu and all living beings, both moving and standing, which come out of the second incarnation, all become manifested. Ultimately, all these creative elements and the creation itself are but manifestations of the Supreme Lord's potency. Nothing is independent of the control of the Supreme Being. This first incarnation in the material creation, namely Karanar, Karanar Navashai Vishnu, is the plenary part of the original personality of Godhead, Sri Krishna. And that's described in the Brahma Samhita also. Vishnor Mahansa Yashya Kala Visheshu 
Govindam Adipursam Tamaham Bajami. All the universes are maintained only during the breathing period of Mahavishnu, who is only a plenary portion of Govinda, the original personality of Godhead, Lord Krishna. Hmm? And then we hear Lord Brahma continues, describes the situation, how Lord Shiva, Lord Vishnu, great generators of beings like Daksha and Prajapati and even Narada and the Kumaras and demigods like Indra and Chandra, all so many, the leaders of the Charana planets, the leaders of the Yakshas and Rakshasas, the great sages, even dead bodies, evil spirits, great aquatics, beasts, birds, everything, anything which is possessed of power, which has any kind of strength or forgiveness or beauty or opulence, it is just simply due to the Supreme Lord. It's only a fragment of the potency of the Supreme Lord. So as we said at the end of the 10th chapter, the same thing, a single fragment of the Lord. So this, we see this in the material world, that everything in this material world, we're thinking very powerful, very great, very opulent, very beautiful. It is all just a tiny fragment of the potency of the Supreme Lord. So the chapter finishes with Lord Brahma encouraging Narada he encourages Narada to hear about the Lord, because by hearing about the Lord, then we can counteract all the contamination within the heart. And the way to hear about the Lord is by hearing about his different incarnations, his different avatars. And that is the subject matter of the next chapter. We will hear about all the different incarnations of the Lord, and the different functions. Okay, are there any questions? Hare Krishna Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Thank you very much Maharaj for a beautiful uh, class. Maharaj, as you were describing the nature of the spiritual world, that uh, women and men, although they are so much beautiful, but they are more attached to the Lord, to the service of the Lord, and they are not uh, bewildered by each other's beauty. So, Maharaj, is there a spiritual gender, an eternal spiritual gender of the living entity? Uh, because either we are women or men in the spiritual world. Is it like... Yes, in the spiritual world, there's, of course, there's gopis and there's gopas. We know. In Vaikuntha also, there's families. And there's men and women. So there are genders. There is the opposite sexes. We know Krishna has the cowherd boys who are with him in the daytime. He has the gopis who are with him in the night. Okay, thank you very much, Maharaj. So Maharaj, is there a way to like... Uh, understand our own spiritual gender? Our spiritual gender is servant. Krishna is the master. He's the supreme male and we are all servants of Krishna. That is our spiritual gender. We should think of ourselves as a servant. Now, it doesn't matter whether man or woman, that's not important. The important point is that we are all servant of Krishna. There's only one male in the spiritual world. Everyone else is the, in, the in it, we're all prakriti. He's the purusha. We are all the prakriti. We're meant for his enjoyment. That is the position. Thank you very much. Any other question? 
Hare Krishna Maharaj. I uh, have a question. Uh, in the purport of, uh, in the purport, Srila Prabhupada purport on text 42, they mention uh, Karana Vasai and Karana Dokasai. This uh, same? Yes, same. same. Thank you. Hare Krishna Maharaj, thank you so much Maharaj, Purusha Sikha, such a nice topic indeed. One of the questions though in mind is, please correct me if the understanding is uh, wrong. So karmis, jnanis, uh, devotees, uh, everyone maybe look at uh, the Virat Rupa, Universal Form, Vishva Rupa, but then because the consciousness is different, then the way we all understand or maybe going forward perceive the idea and then where the devotees get to the devotional service practically as you mentioned but we so it, it feels like the key word is consciousness and Shri Prabhupada also put together is con which is the institute of Krishna consciousness so Mahaji, how do we understand consciousness uh, from the Vedic perspective? Because a lot in modern science has been said about consciousness, but we just say keep Krishna in the center and that's it. So how to understand the word consciousness from Krishna consciousness point of view, Maharaj, please? Well, consciousness, we should understand it is not some material combination of chemicals. Consciousness is a symptom of the soul. Consciousness comes from the soul. Right? How do we identify, how do we perceive the soul? By consciousness. Just as the sun is present by the sunlight. So the same way the soul is perceived through consciousness. So our original consciousness is Krishna consciousness. But our consciousness becomes covered, it becomes polluted, it becomes covered by contact with the material energy and forgetfulness of Lord Krishna. So we have to revive that consciousness, the original consciousness, which is originally pure. The example is given that just like the rain, when it falls from the sky, it's actually pure, pure water. But as soon as it contacts the ground, it becomes contaminated. So in a similar manner, our consciousness is originally pure, but we contact the material energy and we become polluted, we become forgetful, we fall into forgetfulness of Krishna. So we cultivate our consciousness of Krishna through the process of bhakti yoga, by hearing and chanting. And in this way, the remembrance of Lord Krishna comes naturally into the heart. So that consciousness is like the awareness, the, the constant feeling and concern for Krishna. It said the gopis were always conscious, thinking about Krishna. Where is Krishna? He's in the fields, he's walking in the field. The, the ground, there's thorns and there's stones, it will be hurting his feet. Oh, Krishna's poor soft feet on the ground. They're thinking like this. And they're thinking, when is Krishna coming home? Is it time for him to come home yet? And they will look at the sun and see, is the sun setting? Oh, Krishna will be coming soon. In this way, they're constantly thinking of Krishna. So this is consciousness. We consider con uh, uh, this is pure consciousness to be conscious of Krishna. Of course, we first of all have to be conscious of ourselves as a soul before we can become Krishna conscious. We have to understand our original. We have to understand our own nature as a spiritual being, as a spiritual soul. So that consciousness there that I'm not the body. Our consciousness is polluted and we identify with the body. We're thinking, I'm a man, there's a woman, 
we are thinking, I'm young or I'm old, this is all the body, the body consciousness. We have to understand what is pure consciousness. That is to understand, I'm a soul, I'm an eternal spiritual being, part and partial of Lord Krishna. So Prabhupada would often bring people up to the spiritual platform by immediately reminding them that we're not the body. You know, they'd ask Prabhupada, how old are you? Prabhupada would say, I'm the same age as you, I'm a soul. And uh, immediately he would bring them to the spiritual platform. They were looking at Prabhupada as some elderly gentleman. But Prabhupada talked, talk, I'm a soul, just as you are a soul. So this is consciousness, to understand our spiritual identity. Hare Krishna. Thank you so much, Maharaji. Maharaji, just a follow-up on that. So consciousness is thinking, being aware of Krishna. But then who is doing that thinking in us? Is it the body, the mind? Because the mind is material itself. Consciousness is the symptom of soul. Soul is Satyachitanan, the complete... Uh, eternal, conscious, spiritual, then the material mind is being the conscious of the spiritual being. So we are trying to understand the spiritual from material senses. So we have to pure it. When we, when we use the mind to think of Krishna, then the mind becomes spiritualized. That's not material. When the mind is thinking of Krishna, then the, you're bringing the mind to the spiritual platform. The mind is subtle, right? The mind is subtle. So that mind can be the friend, it can be the enemy, remember? So that when, when we think of Krishna, then the mind is a friend. This is a bringing the mind to the pure platform, to pure consciousness, spiritual consciousness. Using the mind to think of Krishna, to remember Krishna. And that pure mind will become part of the spiritual body. You can go back. You don't have to give up the spiritual body. The spiritual body goes back to Godhead. So within the, within the spiritual body, there's a spiritual mind. There's also thinking. It's not that because you have a spiritual body, you don't think. We do. We do think. So there is something which functions like a mind within the spiritual body. Hare Krishna. Thank you so much uh, for your patience. All right. Thank you so much. Yes. Any other question? Okay, so then we'll stop here today and we'll meet tomorrow again. Thank, Thank you very much, Maharaj. Um, the wonderful class. Srila Prabhupada ki jai. Jai. Yes. Go back to Vrindaki jai. Yeah, I'm